Greetings and welcome to today's session. We're going to get started here. My name is Justin Bush and I'm the coordinator of the Washington State Invasive Species Council. The council was created by the state legislature in 2006 and the council is tasked with providing policy level direction, planning, and coordination for combating harmful invasive species throughout the state as well as preventing others that may be harmful. I'd like to welcome you to the third webinar in a series of webinars led by the agencies and universities that are the front lines in protecting our state's natural resources and economy from invasive species. We've called this new network Washington Pest Watch and the premise is that you don't have to actively search for invasive species to be an entomologist or biologist to participate in Washington Pest Watch. We are just asking people to keep an eye out in your yard, your neighborhood, or when enjoying outdoor activities. Be aware and report what you spot. It's really that simple and easy. We know how to detect and stop invasive species, but we need your help. So please be mindful of new invaders, such as those that you'll be hearing about. Um, I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Emily Grayson, who is presenting today. Emily is a marine ecologist and is the program coordinator of the Washington Sea Grants CRAB team. Emily received her PhD from the University of Washington, a Master's of Science from Western Washington University, and a Bachelor of Arts from Bowdoin College in Maine. Emily's research focuses on understanding ecological interactions through the lens of non-native species. As a CRAB team program coordinator with Washington Sea Grant, Emily coordinates a network of citizen scientists who are the eyes on the beach and monitoring for invasive European green crab. Uh, Emily, we thank you for your time and your efforts, and I'm turning it over to you. Thank you so much, Justin. And I want to thank both Justin and Kenzie who have helped uh, coordinate this and make it possible. I really appreciate the role that Washington Invasive Species Council plays in the state in getting out the word and making resources like this accessible to as many people as possible. As uh, Justin mentioned, it really does take a lot of people to effectively manage invasions and not just the people who are working in agencies and, and even for our program to do that. So we are really grateful for all of you to spend your lunch hour with us today learning about invasive European green crab and what you can do to help capture the earliest stages of invasion and, and hopefully help give uh, Washington Salish Sea the best chance it has to avoid the harm caused by this, this critter. So today, um, as Justin mentioned, I'm going to introduce you to this species. I'm going to talk first a little bit about why we care about this species, what the history is, and we'll have an opportunity for some questions after that. And then I'm really going to get into the nitty gritty of, of what this thing looks like, where we expect to find it, and what you should do if you, if you think you found one. So diving right in to European green crab, this is the species in question, and it, this fits right into Washington Invasive Species Council mission. This is uh, considered to be one of the 100 most damaging species on the planet outside of its native range. So the tile on the right that I'm showing you here is uh, the list of the top 100 species as ranked or into this group by the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. So this is a global conservation organization which is rooted in science. Their invasive species specialist group spent some time thinking about invasive species that are, are damaging and widespread around the world. And lo and behold, one that made it to this list is the European green crab Carcinus manus. Fun fact here, Carcinus manus, the Latin name of this crab, actually uh, translates to raving mad or crazy crab. So that maybe gives you some insight into how, how folks feel about its personality. Um, so I, my background is broadly interested in all invasive species and I have the most experience working with marine invasives. Mm -hmm. The program that I represent here today, Crab Team, is a program focused on this single species. And this species has also garnered attention with the Washington Invasive Species Council. It has made it into the top 50 uh, priority watch for um, invasive animals in the state of Washington. I've uh, captured, a, I have a screenshot here of the uh, WISC page on crabs. And there's actually two species on this page. The one on the left is our European green crab. 
Uh, incidentally, the one on the right here is the Chinese mitten crab, which is a, a crab that has, has never been confirmed in the state of Washington, and interestingly is potentially starting to disappear from the West Coast as a whole. Um, however, still something to be on the lookout. By contrast, European green crab is a critter that has been on the West Coast for roughly 30 years and is increasing its range and its abundance. So it continues to garner concern, not only in our state, but also in British Columbia and, and up in Alaska, as well as ongoing work to manage it in, in Oregon and California. So backing up to, to you know, give you a little bit of context about how the European green crab got here and how it got on that list of the 100 most damaging invasive species in the world. This crab truly is a globally invasive species. The native range of this crab, as you might not be surprised to hear from its name, is Western Europe. And it has a range that extends from the North Sea down to the northern coasts of Africa. And from this native range, it's managed to successfully establish populations in almost every temperate marine habitat in the world. Both coasts of North America, the southeast coast of uh, Argentina, southern tip of uh, South Africa, and southeastern Australia are, are some of the most notable established populations. The crab has appeared in other places, but hasn't necessarily set up shop in those places, particularly in uh, more tropical waters. The European green crab doesn't do particularly well in tropical temperatures, um, though it does quite well in on the warmer end of temperate range temperatures. You'll notice here that if you, if you look at our own invasion here, the green crab being on the west coast of North America is a result of transport from the east coast of North America. We actually, we know this from genetic evidence that crabs on the west coast originated on the US east coast. They were probably accidentally brought across the country uh, sometime in the late part of the 20th century by humans moving, uh, moving uh, seaweed and using that as packing material for either bait or for uh, seafood itself. And if that, if green crabs were in that seaweed and improperly disposed of, that's likely how they got transported to the west coast of North America. I'm gonna zoom in here just, to, just a little bit to show you some local history. So I mentioned they came from the US east coast and first were detected in San Francisco Bay in 1989. They were still very rare when they were first detected, so it's likely that they arrived uh, not too long prior to that. But the, uh, after their first detection, they were able to spread via this larval stage that they have. So what I'm showing here on the left side of the screen is what a green crab looks like more or less when it hatches out of its egg. It's a stage called a zoea or a spike head, might be the more colloquial term. And this is the stage that can spend up to 80 or 90 days getting washed around with the currents. And because of this stage, the green crab, even though it was only really introduced to San Francisco Bay, has been able to spread across the West Coast, including a major northward range expansion during 1997-98, which was, as, as some of you might recall, one of the really strongest El Nino uh, events that has, has occurred since the most recent two years. So that event enabled green crab to establish on the outer coast of Oregon, Washington, and British Columbia. Right now, the crab's northernmost range limit is central British Columbia, just north of Bella Bella. Hasn't made it to Southeast Alaska. They are doing sampling and, and trapping to, to keep an eye out for it. Uh, it's likely it, it could make it there soon. It's continued its northward spread. Now, um, on our own coast, as I mentioned, green crab has been found there since the late 90s. However, it's only been periodically abundant in those estuaries. I'm talking about the large coastal estuaries such as Willapa Bay and Grays Harbor. These are places where monitoring has occurred since the late 1990s. And what we'll see is we'll see periodic bumps in green crab showing up, but then they'll disappear. They'll be below detectable levels for three, four, five years at a time until the next, uh, next little bump comes through. Now at that time, even though they've been on the coast for 30 years, they did not make it into the Salish Sea. And we, we have pretty good confidence in this because there was a previous monitoring program all across Washington Salish Sea from 2000 to 2010 that failed to ever detect any evidence that European green crab had 
established populations or uh, was even found in any of these areas. That changed, however, in 2012 when the crab was detected in a place called Souk Basin on the BC side of the Strait of Juan de Fuca, just west of Victoria. Crab were found there in 2012, and at that point they were already numerous enough that it was clear they had been there for at least a few years, and they were numerous enough that they were considered to be what we, you know, what we would consider established, an established population. So what's the big deal having green crab here? It's, you know, we got plenty of native crabs here. What's the big deal having just one more crab? Well, I wanna talk about some of the potential impacts that green crab could have based on what we've seen elsewhere. And a lot of this hinges on the question of whether or not green crab become extremely abundant in, in the Salish Sea as they have in other parts of the world. They do have this tendency, and this is part of what's garnered that reputation they have as a globally damaging invasive species. They do have a tendency to become just astoundingly numerous in places where they set up shop. And just by virtue of having to eat food to stay alive, to make a living and having to live somewhere, they tend to have very dramatic ecological impacts on the habitats that they invade. So I'm gonna show you a, a video here. Make sure that this works. Here we go. A video here. This was taken in the Canadian Maritimes, the mud flat. You can see folks turning back some, overturning some, uh, some mud flat, some mud banks, and just showing the levels of infestation that this crab can reach. So I just bring this up because this uh, really makes a visceral impact when you look at the abundances and, and that they can reach and start to understand why this species could, could really be a problem when it achieves those abundances. So what, what are some of these impacts? Primarily the concern is that green crab, because it is it prefers to be a predator, could harm native organisms directly through both predation and competition. European green crab has a really wide diet. It's not a choosy eater and consumes many things that we ourselves like to consume, some things we don't necessarily like to eat. You, you may not be interested in eating polychaete worms, but those are actually pretty important for a number of species of, for instance, migratory shorebird that rely on coastal estuaries. And green crab are also so undiscerning that they can not only subsist, but reproduce on a diet that's entirely vegetarian. They can eat seaweed and eelgrass, basically anything that they can subdue with their claws will make it onto their menu. This makes them a good invader because they can find something to sub subsist on basically anywhere they show up. But this also means that they have potentially wide ranging ecological impacts, not only the things that they eat and compete with directly, but also all of the species that those critters interact with, the sort of ecological ripple effects. I've put up two examples here on the left of species that we are concerned that green crab could have impacts on and interactions with. So the top one is probably familiar. That's our, our local hero, the Dungeness crab. Now Dungeness crab as adults get much larger than European green crabs. And as adults, they are not vulnerable to European green crabs. Juvenile Dungeness crabs, however, like to use habitats similar to European green crabs preferred habitat types. And when they're the same size, European green crab can outcompete uh, Dungeness crab for both food and shelter. And through those mechanisms, they could negatively impact your uh, Dungeness crab populations. On the bottom here is uh, another crab, no less heroic in my mind, um, but maybe uh, not as familiar, not necessarily on the postcards you find at Pike Place Market. Um, this is our native hairy shore crab, Hemigrapsis oregonensis. This crab is uh, the most numerous critter that we capture in our monitoring. It's incredibly ecologically important. It does not get as large as European green crab. And even though it shares habitat preferences with European green crab, is likely to be quite vulnerable to invasion by this crab. We've seen evidence from both California and Oregon that this crab can uh, be sort of negatively influenced in terms of population by presence of European green crab. So this is a critter that we are particularly concerned about. It's being so numerous now, it's really ecologically important to the food webs in coastal estuaries. So uh, it's, uh, its decline at the hands of, or the claws of European green crab could be bad news for those habitats. 
Now, because of the diet of green crab, there's often quite a bit of concern about what their impacts could be on things that we also like to eat, namely our seafood harvest harvests, particularly commercial shellfish. And um, there is certainly room and, and reason, valid reason for this concern. And in addition to green crabs just liking to eat these things, there's evidence from both, um, let's see, Australia, from South Africa, and from the East Coast of North America in particular, that green crabs can have negative impacts on commercial shellfish harvests. In Maine, for instance, green crab are, are blamed for taking a large share of the responsibility in the soft shell clam industry decline over a number of decades. And so this species can have commercial impacts depending on how harvests are managed. Now, one thing that is potentially good news for our area here is that commercial shellfish growers and some recreational growers already engage in practices that should enable them to protect themselves somewhat from European green crab. So uh, what I'm showing here on the right is a clam beach on Totten Inlet where the clams are grown in bags to protect them from native predation by native crabs. This should also be, imp uh, if implemented um, correctly, can also be effective against European green crab. Now, the downside to this is that this only protects certain harvests in certain places. That is, uh, off-bottom culture and bags and mesh netting can only be used for certain fisheries and only in certain locations. So wild harvest, which uh, tribes and recreation rely on heavily, uh, is not protected in this way. So there are certain types of shellfish harvest that are likely more vulnerable to green crab should they become abundant than others, in particular unprotected shellfish resources. And also those used for conservation beds, for instance, um, stock for Olympia oysters that are maintained to help seed the recovery of that population. One concern that's gaining increased attention, particularly on the east coast of the U.S., is negative impacts on eelgrass beds. Green crab have been observed to rip up roots and plants of eelgrass as they forage in soft sediment habitats, digging for food, digging for those bivalves and worms. They will also consume the growing parts of eelgrass tissue, and there's new evidence that they eat the seeds of eelgrass themselves. So it's, it's something of a triple whammy when it comes to green crab impacts on eelgrass. And the concern is that through these mechanisms, green crab could damage what is in our area an incredibly important habitat for juvenile salmon, for crabs, and of course for migratory shorebirds as well. And of course, anytime you say salmon in this area, you're also talking about orcas. So there's really a non-trivial link between green crab and orcas potentially if they become abundant enough to negatively impact eelgrass beds. And evidence from the East Coast suggests that, that is, um, that's indeed a possibility. These here are two photos of the exact same location that were taken about 10 years apart of a single place. Uh, this is McCoyt Bay, Maine. On the left side, the first photo that was taken in, I think, 2003 or so, um, it shows a really, really robust, large, healthy eelgrass bed at low tide. And the right photo was taken in, I think, 2013 of the same location, which is showing a barren mudflat. And this correlates with the increase in abundance of European green crab over that same time period. So green crab is probably one of more multiple factors, but certainly one that is strongly associated with the decline of eelgrass in some locations on the East Coast. And there's, there's a lot of concern about whether that could occur here too, if green crab become very abundant. So what's being done about European green crab here in Washington and more regionally? So here in, in Washington's inland waters, we're really in an early detection rapid response phase of management. Um, this, our goal here is to find European green crab at the earliest possible stages of invasion and trap them aggressively to reduce the chances that they could take hold and spread. Now on the coast of Washington, where green crab have been present off and on for several decades, there's, this is sort of considered a separate management unit. Um, and inland, where green crab are just starting to show up, it's being managed much more intensively in this EDRR phase. So what this looks like, how this plays out, um, first, of course, early detection surveillance, that's, a, that's what we're here to talk about today. 
as Justin alluded to, CRAB team exists at Washington Sea Grant. This is a program primarily of citizen science volunteers, along with a few agency and tribal staff that monitor as well. A network of 54 sites throughout Washington's inland waters that actively search for European green crab six months of the year. In addition, we work, we at CRAB team work to conduct training with agency and tribal staff to train the managers who are out there every day or lots of days on beaches, especially beaches where other folks don't tend to spend a lot of time so that they can do the, the, the same thing even if they aren't actively trapping for green crabs so that they know what to look for and can help us increase the scope of our surveillance. And then lastly, and not least for being last, um, what we're doing right here, essentially educating anybody who spends time on the shoreline, near the salt water, in marshes, uh, to expand the network of people who know what to look for and know what to do if they think they have found something. So this is the, the early detection surveillance network and, and how it's all put together. Um, and this is primarily the work that CRAB team does. Now, when a detection is made, this advances, when a green crab is found in a new place, this advances to um, an assessment of, uh, doing an assessment of the population. This is typically an, extent, an intensive two to three day trapping effort to determine the extent of any population. How big is it? How many are there? And what size are they? How long have they been there? Questions like that. Now, at this point, we typically uh, partner with Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. WDFW is the state agency responsible for managing this, this, this species in state waters and um, in, in state shorelines. And so WDFW takes the lead on these activities and will get in there and, and send personnel out to do trapping and determine the extent of the population. Now, depending on what's found there, um, we go into sort of an ongoing management phase. If no more green crabs are found, if or maybe just a handful, two or three, the site moves to to be continued conti ongoing monitoring. So we will conduct, we will maybe bring it into the crab team network of sites and conduct monthly small scale monitoring. And then we aim to repeat the assessment trapping annually just to keep an eye on it to make sure there's no unmissed pockets of crabs that have started to reproduce there. If more than just a handful of crabs are found, uh, an ongoing management plan is enacted, which um, so far we really only have one or two of those that we can give as, as examples. And the intensive, um, the goal there is to do as much trapping as possible to remove as many crabs as possible. Now, um, you're welcome to ask me about this if this is a question that you have, but trapping right now is really the only tool that we have to remove green crab. And it's incredibly uh, labor intensive and it requires consistent repeated efforts to, um, to remove an, a number of crabs. Um, so currently the best option we have is to throw as many traps out there as possible and try to just pull out every crab we can, we can get our hands on. So where are they now? What do we know? A lot of what we know so far, since we are still in this early detection phase, is owing to the crab team early detection network. And this is the map I'm showing you here on the right. So there are symbols here that look sort of like upside down teardrops. And those symbols are each of the 54 monitoring sites in the crab team network. You can see they're distributed all the way up to Drayton Harbor, practically within the site of Canada, San Juan Islands, all the way down to Nisqually Reach in uh, near Olympia, Hood Canal, and then all the way as far west as, as Pisht, that, that site is Pisht there. Um, so the red teardrop shapes are the sites at which, the monitoring sites at which European green crab have been detected. And those yellow dots there are individual uh, geolocations of all of the European green crab that have been confirmed on Washington's side of the Salish Sea. So one thing I also wanna point out here, I mentioned that populations in Souk Basin, just west of Victoria, which is where crabs were first found in 2012, um, and that's what reinitiated concern about this species and launched uh, the formation of crab team. This is the location of that basin. It's, it's not very big, it's about four square miles, um, but it does have a fair number of European green crab in it. So what do we know so far? So the very first European green crab confirmed in Washington's inland waters was captured by crab team volunteers in 2016. And that was in Westcott Bay in the north end of San Juan Island. You can see that, that red flag there on the north end of San Juan Island. 
that was in August of 2016. Volunteers had been monitoring since April of 2016 each month, and August was the first green crab they caught. Incidentally, following that, including um, an assessment effort, no green crabs were caught until about two weeks ago. We were up there for a training workshop and happened to capture a couple more, and then another one was captured during regular monthly monitoring last month. So this is a site of, of ongoing concern. To date, summing all of the critters that, all of the green crab that have been caught on Washington's side, closer probably, if I were to update this today, probably closer to 170 green crab, individual crabs have been caught. And I wanna point out that the vast majority of those are located at one site, that's at Dungeness Spit. The other locations that you see there in Padilla Bay, Fidalgo Bay, Whidbey Island, and Swim Bay, we're really talking there about no more than four crabs over you know, up to three years um, for, for each of those sites. So really, really low numbers at those sites with the exception of Dungeness Spit where uh, most of the crabs have been found in a single channel that's about half a kilometer long. It's a really concentrated site that um, brings up a couple of crabs per week with the ongoing management trapping that they're doing at that site. Of the 54 crab team sites, nine of them have had green crab recorded at them at some point. Again, mostly just one detection or a very small number at each of those sites. From the sizes of the crabs and the times when we find them, we can estimate their age and when they arrived uh, here in, in Washington Salish Sea. We see evidence that there has been a multiple arrival events of these crabs that they most likely came as, as larvae rather than being accidentally transported here by humans. And I can talk about why, why, what evidence and why we believe that's the case if, if someone has that question. Um, and we currently don't, have not yet seen any evidence of establishment. We are starting to see, particularly at, at Dungeness Spit and um, I, I also Westcott Bay, multiple year classes being found within a single site, which is sometimes evidence of establishment, meaning that um, either multiple arrival events at that one site have occurred or that there's been local reproduction. Um, but we don't know for sure whether the crabs are locally reproducing or whether there's just repeated uh, events where larvae are getting washed in. It's very difficult to tell the difference between those two mechanisms. And um, so we've never yet to date found a crab that is a female that is bearing eggs in Washington Salish Sea. And that would be, you know, something that obviously would be pretty concerning to us. Um, but the population has the potential in terms of size to become sort of, to be, uh, have a high reproductive capacity, particularly at Dungeness Fit. Now, summarizing all of this uh, information and all of the work that we've done since, let's say 2015 on Washington side of the Salish Sea, we have captured on average for every 100 traps we set, we catch about a, a crab and a half for every 100 traps we set. This, um, this number represents the fact that we are doing a lot of work to look for European green crab. All of these sites that you see flagged here are being monitored monthly. There's a number of other efforts that are ongoing with different groups and agencies, DFW, doing additional trapping. So there's a lot of traps out there looking for European green crab, not to mention all the people who out, are out there with their eyes on the beach as well, looking for shells and, and other things. Now, to, to put this number in some context, on the BC side of the Salish Sea, that same number is about 666 crabs for every 100 traps that they set. And this includes trapping other, all the way up into the Southern Gulf Islands. However, almost every single one of the crabs they've captured, with the exception of a dozen of them, have been found in that one location in Souk Basin. Uh, the 15 that were found other, other than that are just outside, just to the east of Souk Basin in one tiny, tiny little spot. So they're really restricted currently on the BC side of the Salish Sea, but their numbers are a lot higher than, than what we're seeing. So putting this all together, where I typically characterize our, our status is that we are at the early stages of a potential invasion of Washington's inland shorelines. The numbers are still low enough that we can have a pretty substantial impact by getting out ahead of the invasion. And that's a, that's a pretty, I don't know how many of you listening are, are sort of in invasion management, but this is a pretty unique place to be. And it's pretty remarkable. We have a very good opportunity for more effective control than in other scenarios. 
One other population I should point out is not technically in the inland waters of Washington. It's not technically inside the Salish Sea, but it is just around the corner in uh, Macaw Bay on tribal lands. There are two river estuaries there where green crab have just recently arrived and are being uh, found in some numbers. They were first detected there last, late last summer. Someone reported them to, to crab team and we were able to connect with DFW and with the tribe since they are on Macaw lands. And McCall uh, Natural Resources staff has been working out there aggressively to trap out as many crabs as, as they can. And um, though it's not strictly within the Salish Sea, the fact that it is a, a relatively new population and the fact that it's likely in terms of you know biogeography, how close it is, it's likely that it's connected to populations that are further inland um, is is a reason that that we want to really keep an eye on this population and and try to manage it heavily. So how did they get here? what do what do we think about how it is that the crabs got here? Well, we have some pretty good information about the crabs that arrived in souk. Um, the crabs arrived in souk as a result of human transport of contaminated mussels for biotoxin monitoring. And those mussels were, were moved to souk from the outer coast further up north on Vancouver Island in an area that's been infested for some time. They weren't uh, treated evidently and that enabled green crabs to get smuggled into souk basin. Now, um, this evidence has been confirmed by, um, by some genetic work. Now, what about Dungeness spit? Well, our first assumption was that the crabs at Dungeness spit and all the other ones we're finding inland uh, were the result of larvae coming from souk, but it turns out that that is not the case. We have done, we partnered with Carolyn Tiepold, who's a researcher at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. And um, Carolyn's done some really nice uh, genomics work on green crab all up and down the West Coast. And it's what's one of the things that we, we've recently learned that's extremely surprising and interesting is the crabs that are in Souk Basin are genetically very distinct from the crabs that are in the southern populations on the outer coast, which is, uh, which is uh, where we assume the crabs at Dungeness Spit potentially could have come from. So because of that genetic difference, we can tell that the crabs at Dungeness Spit did not come from Souk. They are genetically similar to crabs on the outer coast, either Oregon, California, Washington, or even BC. And in, for that reason, um, we, can, we can discern that those, the crabs at Dungeness Spit, are, they got washed in from the outer coast rather than just from souk. Again, we, this is a little surprising to us given the fact that those two sites are so close to each other, we assume that it just had to be souk. However, for the crabs that are found in further inland in the Central Salish Sea, we don't yet know where they are coming from. We're now collecting um, tissue samples to try to do some of the same genetic work to see, are they coming from souk? Are they coming from the outer coast? What are the, some of the dynamics but among the populations or among the sites where crabs are found in terms of, of where they're coming from? One more quick interesting story in terms of how crabs are, are moving around in this region. The population at Nia Bay is a little bit, or at, uh, sorry, at Macaw Bay is a little bit um, interesting. What we can see when we look at the genomics of crabs from uh, Macaw Bay, from those two river estuaries, is that those crabs are coming from outer coast populations and there are some individuals that have come from Souk Basin. So we can see the genetic signature of both of those separate populations on the crabs that end up inhabiting Macaw Bay. So there's clear connectivity between what's going on in Macaw Bay and what's going on in the Salish Sea. Again, that's a reason why we, we try to focus um, some, of our, some of our resources on, understand, on managing that population. Okay, so that's, a, that's a, what's hopefully a quick status update. Um, I wanna just give you a heads up that the next portion I'm gonna uh, talk about how early detection works, um, how to identify green crab, and what you should do if you find one. But I thought now was a good chance to pause for any questions that you might have related to sort of background, ecology of European green crab. And again, remember there'll be more time at the end. So I'm gonna take a pause here and give you an opportunity to, um, to ask questions which uh, Justin and Kenzie will manage. Great, Th thanks Emily. So uh, folks that are, that are uh, participating or um, either raise your hand or type your question into the question box and we can read it aloud. OK, 
Okay, Emily, we have a question from Vanessa. Vanessa asks, are there any deep water green crab populations nearby? Thanks, Vanessa. Uh, that's a good question. Green crab are not typically found in deep water. Um, one of the things I'll talk about coming up is that large Dungeness and European green crab, I'm sorry, large Dungeness and red rock crab are actually pretty good predators and competitors of even adult European green crab. That is, when the native crabs are large, they outcompete uh, European green crab. And so they tend to keep green crab restricted to shallow intertidal habitats. And I'll point out what some of those are in the upcoming section. There don't appear to be any other questions. Okie doke, happy to, happy to keep cruising because I'm sure everyone wants to get to the, to the crabby part of this anyway. So um, I, again, feel free if you, have, if you do have more questions about those types of things to, to check in with us at the end. Okay, so what is it that we can do um, about European green crab? We have a couple of strategies that you heard me mention earlier here at Crab Team. One is getting our eyes on the beach, that's what we're talking about today. And the other is getting some boots in the mud volunteering with crab team. I'm going to take just a moment to talk about boots in the mud, although primarily what I'll be focusing on um, is, is preparing you to be eyes on the beach. So boots in the mud is what we call the crab team network of monitoring in terms of the early detection site. These folks are currently in the networks about 200 volunteers. Uh, you saw the map of 54 sites. We also partner with a, a couple dozen agency and tribal staff. And these, these folks, all of them, regardless of whether they're volunteer or staff, they undergo about 10 hours of training, both workshop and classroom. They get matched up to, to sites that we think are the best habitat for European green crab. And they monitor once per month, April through September. That's the time of year when crabs are most detectable, even when they're pretty rare. Um, when they monitor, they set some baited traps in a standardized uh, array of traps. They conduct a systematic uh, molt hunt, so they're looking for shells of European green crab and other critters, other crabs they might find, crustaceans. And they also collect a small amount of data on some shoreline habitat features. Now the goal of, of crab team, as I mentioned, of course is early detection. We've designed our protocols to be really sensitive and find green crab when they're really still quite rare. However, we want to take advantage of having 230 people out there looking for green crab to establish a baseline for quantifying impacts of European green crab. So when our volunteers submit data, they're not just submitting data on were there green crab, yes or no. They're submitting data on every organism that appears in the traps, every molt that they find, and again, some of those shoreline features. This will set us up to quantify the impacts of European green crab. I talked about some of the potential impacts Every invasion is different and it's very, very difficult to predict what will happen in a new invasion. So our goal is to just directly quantify these things as they're happening. Hopefully, of course, they don't. Um, and that will enable us to better prioritize management actions um, and make arguments that, that this is a species that does need to be managed. So I'm putting the plug in that if, if this is something that you think you'd be interested in, we conduct trainings once per year in late winter in March. And um, we have a, a limited number of opportunities that show up, um, as in uh, we have a, a network of sites and if volunteers, um, you know, decline to, ongoing volunteers decline to participate, then a slot might open up at a site. And we have a better idea of that, what that situation is in, in winter. So if that is something that you're interested in, please do feel free to get in touch with us and we'll get you signed up for our newsletter so that you can get the announcement of when the trainings are and, and, and keep up with us then. But until then, we are really excited to have you be eyes on the beach and have you know what to look for. This is our, our monitoring map again. As you can see, that's a lot of sites, but there's a lot of gaps between the sites as well. And that's where we need other folks looking for, uh, for, for green crab in places we don't have the resources to. So today I wanna to talk to you about what it is you're looking for, where you would look, and what you might do if you think you found a European green crab. So this is, the, this is the species in question. This is the culprit. This is our raving mad crab. And um, depending on how familiar you are with crabs, this might look just like a typical 
a typical prototypic crab. It sort of doesn't necessarily look that remarkable um, in, in many ways. Uh, and, in, and in a lot of cases, they can actually be confused for native crabs. So it bears pointing out some of the features that are most helpful for distinguishing it from native species. And this crab doesn't get very large. It grows up at a maximum of about four inches across the back shell, the carapace. And that size is larger than it grows anywhere else in the world. We grow them big here. Um, but it still doesn't get as big as a, an adult Dungeness crab or red rock crab. Now, the really uh, helpful features are not necessarily the eyes. Most crabs have eyes. But I point out the eyes here for reference. Um, to what is the most important feature for identification. And that is the spines across the outside of the back shell to the outside of each of the eyes. These are called marginal teeth. This crab species has five marginal teeth and no other species you're likely to encounter in this area has that same number and that same shape. So if all you remember from this talk is five spines to the outside of each eye, then I will have um, prepared you to go forth and look for European green crab. Um, I'll point out just a couple of other things. One is the overall shell shape. This can be used in, in comparison with other species that, of native crab. Um, we actually, notwithstanding the fact that I've drawn a, a six-sided shape here, we call it a pentagonal shell. It's more or less flat between the eyes, and that can be helpful for distinguishing between other species. Now, I say it's more or less flat, but I'm actually pointing out the fact that there are three bumps between the eyes. Here, I'll remove some of this other stuff so you can see those three bumps, one, two, three, between the eyes. Um, and that um, those bumps are pretty small and rounded compared to some other species. OK, so it's helpful to know what to look for, but it's also helpful to know what not to look for. <laughs> and um, this, can, this can help you sort of rule out some other crabs. Now, um, in terms of, of European green crab, more often than not, because it has the word green in its name, folks often assume that the best characteristic to look for the crab is, is actually a, a, just if you find a crab that is green, you're on the right track. Well, um, it turns out it's much trickier than that, and that's for a few reasons. One reason is that European green crab can have a variety of patterns that are not necessarily green. So they can range, these are all juvenile crabs here I've just shown you. They can range from almost pure white to blotchy to pure black and various striping patterns. That helps them camouflage when they're young, um, and so they can be not necessarily green. Another thing is that even adults can be not green. Even adult green crabs are sometimes actually red. This individual here is, um, is, is pretty large. This is one I found in Maine when I was there a couple years ago, and they can be brick red, and the underside can be bright orange. Here's a bright, oh, actually, there's a later slide, I'll show you a picture of a bright orange one. Um, the third reason is that oftentimes the evidence of European green crabs being found is not a live crab, but a molted crab shell. Those obviously fade and bleach out, so there's no color that's helpful for um, the diagnostic. And then, of course, the other thing that can be make it confusing is that we have a number of native crab species that are more or less green or greenish. And these crabs can be um, just if you sort of cue in on the word green, these can be confused for European green crab. So if not the color, then what are, how do we compare and contrast the European green crab to some native species and get an idea of, um, of how we tell it apart? So in the next few slides, I'm gonna explicitly compare green crab to native species. Green crab will always be on the left side of the screen and the native species will always be on the right side of the screen. On the right side, I'm showing you two of our common intertidal shore crabs on the top is Hemigrapsis oregonensis, our hairy shore crab. I mentioned him before. And the bottom is purple shore crab, Hemigrapsis nudis. Now, again, all you really need to know to tell European green crab apart is the fact that it has those five spines. Comparing that to our shore crabs, both species of shore crab have only three spines to the outside of each eye. On purple shore crab, they're almost hard to count because the spine, those spines are so rounded and so almost smoothed over. But there are, if you, if you look quite closely, there are only three spines. The next thing is the overall shell shape. I mentioned this, um, this angular shell shape of maybe a pentagon or uh, almost a diamond shape, gem, gem shape in European green crab. By contrast, the shore crabs are quite square. Shore crabs also don't get as large as European green crab. 
Um, purple shore crabs can get up to about three inches across the back shell. If you find something larger than that, it's it's maybe con you know could could be considered confusing, but um, uh, but and and hairy shore crab get to be only maybe about two inches across the back shell, not quite as large. But overall, the mar number of marginal teeth and the overall shell shape can uh, help you disentangle our native shore crabs from European green crab. Hairy shore crab in particular are super common and you, you, you see them in almost every beach in some form or other. Um, and so they are, um, because of their color, sometimes confused. Okay, so the next commonly confused species uh, our group of native spider crabs, I'm showing you here the northern kelp crab, Pugetia producta, is, is perhaps one of the most frequently misreported, uh, misidentified, reported, suspected European green crabs. Um, I think even though, you know, to my mind, and maybe when you see these really nice photos side by side, it, you know, you, you might be surprising to see that these are, that this crab is confused for European green crab. But I think what happens is that these, these spider crabs tend to be subtital. These are crabs, if you lay on your belly on a pier and you look down at the pilings, you might see them walking up and down the pilings. They do like to live in kelp beds. So if you have the good fortune to go diving in a kelp bed, you might see these crabs. Um, but they're primarily subtital. And so casual everyday beachgoers don't necessarily see them very often. But when they hear about uh, a nasty European green crab coming and they want to keep their eyes out for this species, and then they see an unfamiliar crab, um, they, they might worry that it's a European green crab. And kelp crabs, especially certain species, can be quite green in color. This, this picture doesn't show it that well, but they can be very green. Now, the helpful, um, the shell shape is most helpful here because it's the most consistent difference between all of our species of spider crabs and European green crab. I'm pointing out the eyes here again for reference, and you'll notice that in the kelp crab that I've shown you, the, the spines between the eyes, which are called the rostrum, stick out very far between the eyes, giving overall the shell is longer front to back than it is side to side. And by contrast here, the green crab shell is longer, wider side to side than it is long front to back. And in between the eyes, the green crab has what is, you know, relatively flat rostrum without those huge pointy spines that the kelp crab has. So just this, just this overall um, carapace difference between them is a good way to tell the two species apart. The next species that's commonly confused for green crab is our native hairy helmet, cra helmet crab. This is another one that's subtitled, pretty uncommon, and it sometimes it can be pretty abundant if you're looking at crab molts washed onto the shore, and this, this can be one that shows up pretty frequently. But seen, it's not that often that it's seen live. Sometimes it does show up in, in crab traps, but not really not that frequently. The biggest difference here is if you notice just all of the bristles and hairs and bumps all over the shell of the hairy helmet crab here. Those, um, those bristles are characteristics, they're little hairs that stick through the shell of the crab all over its legs, its back of its carapace, its underside, its claws, and give it its name. Um, even when the shell is shed and those hairs aren't still there, the bumps remain on the carapace. Now by contrast, green crab has a very smooth shell. If we look at the, the number of teeth, green crab has five and this crab has six, uh, just starting from, from the back of the eye. But again, that hairiness is the first thing that you notice and, um, and is the quickest way to, to shortcut the difference. The overall shell shape also is different in that the helmet crab has a much pointier nose, almost similar to the fact the pointy uh, spines in between the eyes of the kelp crab we just saw. In addition, just to give you a zoomed out view, this, this crab has actually very, very long legs. It's a super speedy crab. Um, and and is, is really cool to watch when it's in its element underwater. These are the crabs that are perhaps most familiar to, to most of you, especially if you crab recreationally. These are three species of large native cancer or cankered crabs. Um, it's not super common that these are mistaken for European green crab, but it, be, it does bear pointing out just a few salient differences. First, of course, being the number of marginal teeth. Again, here's the five on the on the European green crab. All three of these species, Dungeness on top, rock crab on bottom, and our graceful crab, a smaller cousin of the Dungeness crab in the middle, all of them have 10 marginal teeth. Sometimes it's hard to get to exactly 10, but if you have, again, if you have more than five marginal teeth, 
then you know you don't have a European green crab. The shell shape is also uh, different. These are what we call oval or fan-shaped carapaces in the cancer crabs. And just overall, they're very, very wide relative to their length, uh, wider width to length than um, green crab is. The last crab I want to mention is our black clawed crab. This is one that's pretty unusual to see it at all, unless you're really looking, turning over rocks in cobbly areas. Um, but you can see, based on the shell shape, why it might be confused for European green crab. It also has a sort of similar flat-fronted appearance. Um, one thing I want to point out is true to its name, this crab has black claws. European green crab um, has a little bit of a, a darkish cast to the, the end of its claws, but nothing near the solid black of a black clawed crab. And that um, those black tips are similar to what you would see in a rock crab. Uh, same process forms that dark coloration and, and is a feature. And then I also want to zoom in on this on, on a slightly different picture to point out the carapace teeth are also different for this crab. So the five teeth on the European green crab are really distinctive. They really jut out and are individualized. The black clawed crab does only have three marginal teeth and they almost look like they've been worn down. Although that's how the crab's uh, marginal teeth look their entire lives. They are just very, very small and almost indistinct, hard to count. And that's very different from a European green crab. So this is a pretty rare crab, but it is one that when folks find it, they're concerned they found a European green crab because of that shell shape. A Couple of quick, quick notes about where we expect green crab to be detectable um, in terms of where we expect we might be able to find evidence of them when they're still rare. This is places like pocket estuaries and salt marshes. This is a nice muddy channel at low tide of a salt marsh has overhanging banks that green crabs really like to burrow into. We have here a quiet lagoon that's separated by a channel from um, the open beach. And here's a muddy bank. Again, these banks that green crabs really like to burrow into when the, when the tide drops, similar to our native shore crabs. So these pocket estuaries and salt marshes, they aren't typically what you would think of as, as crab habitat. And that's, that's not a coincidence. You don't go looking for Dungeness crab here um, and, and that's because these are habitats that large cancer crabs don't like. Because these places are protected from those large cancer crabs, green crab can survive better in them and even thrive to a certain extent. So these are places where we expect that green crabs will be able to hang on even when they're still very rare. And that's why we spend our, most of our time looking in these places. Here's another example. This is the marsh at Westcott Bay where the green crabs have been recently found. You can see there's just these beautiful channels with some pickleweed poking up there and some really, really good smelling mud. Um, this is Lagoon Point on the west, west side of Whidbey with um, crab team member Sean McDonald in there for scale. Just a really small lagoon with a tide gate in it. Uh, let's see, three green crab have been found there over the last three years to date. So this is a um, an interesting place to keep an eye on. And then a crab was recently found at Dungeness Landing. Again, it's one of these channeled marshes. You can see the pickleweed on the bank there hanging over, forming protective habitat, and just these shallow intertidal um, channels that form the habitat that green crabs really love. So we're talking about muddy places. That's often a surprise to folks um, who think of big sandy beaches as a place to look for crabs. Um, and we're talking about places that have protective structure. We're that means those banks that enable them to burrow into some vegetation or even riprap walls in low energy habitats can provide protection for green crab. Areas with uh, a low to moderate amount of freshwater input. So green crabs can't survive in fully fresh water, but they can survive at lower salinities than many of our native crabs. So some amount of freshwater input can actually protect them from those larger crabs. Then we also talk about indicator species such as our hairy shore crab um, that like habitat similar to European green crab. And so when we see lots and lots of hairy shore crab, we think that that could be a good site for invasive European green crab. There are a couple of places where you're less likely to spot European green crabs. And it doesn't mean it's not possible. It just means it's, it's less likely, especially at this stage early in the invasion. If you're targeting an area to get legal sized Dungeness crabs, these, these are some of the deep water habitats Vanessa's question was about, 
you might not expect to bring up European green crabs in your traps because those are the types of habitat green crab we expect would get eaten in by Dungeness and particularly by rock crabs. Rock crabs are great predators of European green crabs. Sandy or rocky beaches. Sandy beaches don't provide much of that protective habitat and rock be rocky beaches often are inhabited by rock crabs. Again, good predators of European green crab. And then again, deep water, um, Vanessa leading <laughs> great with that question earlier. And again, because those are places where larger predators are found that could not just crabs, but also um, other large fishes that could keep European green crab in check. I wanna point out a resource online. This is a map that we've created. I showed you a version of it earlier with our monitoring sites on it. This is publicly available and you can browse this map. We've also created a layer on it that has sites marked that are particularly good habitat for European green crab. Many of these are surveyed, but many of these are not. So these are the types of areas that we think could be particularly good for European green crab when, to survive at when they arrive and, um, and, and are at small numbers. So um, if there are some that are near you that you have access to, again, you know, this, this map doesn't imply that, that we have um, any access to these properties, just that the habitat looks good. So make sure that you have a legal way and safe way to access these places. Um, they could be places that you keep an eye on near you for European green crab. Now, what do you do if you think you have found a European green crab? So, um, Quick action is very helpful. Uh, and often, from what I've heard from folks, one of the very first things that they do is they say, oh my gosh, I found a green crab. And then, oh darn it, I found a green crab. So once you get through sort of processing the, the sort of emotional excitement of finding European green crab, the next thing that you need to do is to take several photos from different angles of both the top and bottom of the crab and using a scale object in the photograph so that we can uh, get size information on it. Now the next thing to do, and I appreciate this is going to be completely counterintuitive, is to leave the crab where you found it. Um, the reason for this is that green crab are still extremely rare in this area and 99% of reports are thankfully um, misidentified native species. So when WDFW had a previous outreach effort in the um, early 2000s, they asked folks who found a green crab to freeze it and mail it to them. And in the mail, they received hundreds of frozen native crabs, but not one single European green crab. So we're trying to avoid mass mortality of, of native crabs here. And those because, largely because these native crabs could be um, our best protection against European green crabs. So we, we need to take care of their populations. Um, now, by sending us the photos, all we need to confirm a sighting is a, as a, is a photograph and a location. That's enough to trigger a response effort and us getting out there very, very quickly with uh, traps and with personnel to do some ex exploration looking for green crab in the area. I also want to point out here that this crab is uh, considered a level one prohibited species in the state of Washington. That means it's illegal to possess this crab without a permit to do so. so folks who participate in our programs obtain these permits um, but you know the, the other thing about leaving the crab in place is, is to um, you know make sure we, we all stay in compliance with the state regulations. Take that information and email it with location details to our email which is crabteam at uw.edu. This is a, a shared email account so we check it really regularly. If you have GPS coordinates on the site, that's ideal. If you don't, just give us as much detail as possible of, of where you were. And remember, um, we're dealing with 2,500 miles of shoreline. We're pretty familiar with it, but we might need um, a couple of location references to help us figure out where it is you're talking about. Turns out there are about a million places in Washington state that are called Mud Bay, and we sample a lot of them. So if, you know, if you're at a place um, that is in Mud Bay, help us figure out which, which Mud Bay it is exactly. Um, one thing that I, these photos here on the right, these are all photos that I took of a crab in Maine and notice on the bottom that's that bright orange underside that can sometimes occur. And this is a female with eggs. She's bearing eggs. Um, and thankfully she wasn't in Washington. Thankfully she was in Maine. Now what I didn't do in these photos was that I should have done was to include a picture with some something for scale. Um, Neil Harrington here took this top picture and he happened to have calipers, which are super helpful, but even if you all you have is a coin of a standardized size, that can help us figure out how what size the crab is when you submit a photo. 
One last thing that I want to point out is that this crab, as one of the top priority invasive animals uh, for the Washington Invasive Species Council, is available to report on the WISC app. If you have that on your phone and you're already using it, the reports get forwarded to us, to that same email, and um, we can verify and get the information to the folks who it needs to go to. So if you're already using this, um, you're more than welcome to contribute that way. But if you uh, would prefer, you can email us directly. We do, however, need a photograph of the crab to be able to um, devote any resources to it. So it's really worth it to, to do what you can to get a photo. Okay, so um, that's all of the material I have for you today. I would love to take questions if there are any. And I'd also like to acknowledge the volunteers and folks who participate in the monitoring program who make all of the information I presented to you today possible. I also want to give you a couple of ways to contact us, that email, but also our website and social media. On our website, you can sign up for our newsletter that comes out about twice a year just by uh, email newsletter and, um, and also sends out an announcement about things like our trainings as well uh, so that you can become, keep abreast of what's going on and, and get engaged, more engaged if you would have any interest in, in being so. So I want to thank you guys all very much for, for sharing your lunch hour with, with us and learning about this crab and for your help getting out there, getting eyes on the beach. And I'd, I'd be happy to spend some time answering questions if you have any. Thanks. Great. Well, thank you, Emily, and um, fantastic job. Uh, we'll now um, have a question and answer period. So if you have a question, please type it into the question box and, and I'll read that for Emily or um, feel free to raise your hand and we'll unmute you. Emily Jennifer Lombard says thank you very much. Again, just go ahead and raise your hand, we'll unmute you, or um, go ahead and enter your question into the, the question box. Sandy says, very good presentation, Emily. Very thorough and comprehensive. Thank you very much. Thanks, Sandy. Justin, I also wanted to point out um, the handout that's available on, on as um, is a little eight and a half by eleven flyer that has that you can print out, take with you, um, post places that has identification and response information. So that's available for um, for all of you out there who are listening. If you'd like something to hold on to. Great, thanks for that reminder, Emily. Uh, we do, we do have a question from Michaela. Michaela asked, do you provide talks to groups like Beach Watchers? We do um, provide uh, talks to Beach Watchers and other shore, shoreline, any, basically anybody who wants to, <laughs> to, to hear, wants to learn about European green crab. Um, feel free to drop us an email. Um, that's an important part of what we do, not just getting the word out to you folks, but getting to, the word out definitely to anybody who spends time on the beach. So, so yeah, definitely send me, send me an email, Michaela. Great, thanks Emily. We've got a question from Jennifer. Uh, Jennifer says that she learned a ton and her question is, um, do you and your team ever visit high school classes and is there any chance you could visit an environmental science classroom sometime? Thanks Jennifer, I'm glad I was able to share, share some good information. Um, that's a great question. We have not been able to develop our, um, you know, uh, general ed, curriculum so far yet. Um, it's something, feel, feel free to drop me an email, it's something that we talk about doing more, but we have not um, been able to spend as much time developing that curriculum as, as we would like to, mostly um, trying to keep keep people out there monitoring takes up a lot of, a lot of our time, unfortunately, but in, in a lot of cases, we could potentially provide you with information for you to share with, with your class if we can't help more directly. 